Hello. Oh, good morning. All right. Um, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the session on proactive city data governance. My name is Matthias Redman, and I'm a policy officer at the European Commission. And if you're interested to find out what the European Commission is doing, I invite you to um, take a look at the stand outside on the European Innovation Partnership, where we um, share um, what is happening in Europe, and also take a look at the projects that are run throughout the European Union. Or join us tomorrow afternoon for a session on urban platforms. We look into uh, the hardware and software to deal with city data. And so in a sense, it's the continuation of this session here today, where we will talk about the opportunities and the challenges of governance in, uh, for city data. And this topic is, has really become um, a, a big cornerstone for cities because the amount of, um, of data and the interest in it is increasing on a daily basis. And the five speakers we have here today will share um, their insights on the challenges and the opportunities that cities will face. So um, just to give you a, a quick intro into the topic, the the, this, this big amount of data that, that cities sit on and the new digital technologies that, you know, all of us have at our disposal on our smartphones can really change cities dramatically. Cities can, city governance, uh, governments can truly become uh, intelligent and they can be able or will be able to deliver sm smarter, more resilient and more responsive public services. But to do that, they will have to face quite a few challenges. Many of the cities in Europe and in the world lack um, capacity, they lack skills and or funds to, um, to properly manage and deal with their city data. They will have to join up the different departments in their city and the different service providers that each individually sit on huge data sets, but only the combination of those will bring true benefits to the city and the citizens. Also, the cities will have to deal more and more with new disruptive services like Airbnb that um, put them in a challenge to, or that, that challenges the local economy, the, um, the, the local welfare system, but also tax revenues. But at the same time, they in huge demand by citizens and travelers. And the, the deeper that um, cities deal, or the more that cities deal with, uh, with city data, the more they will also have to look in privacy and security issues, um, because that's a huge concern of many citizens. So in summary, cities have to strike a, uh, a good balance between technological potential, their own city needs, but also the citizen interests and concerns. And we have these five speakers here from across the globe that will um, share their insights. Each of them will give a short speech or presentation of roughly eight minutes. And then we'll have a Q&A session towards the end of this uh, session of roughly 15 minutes. And during the run of the presentations, you're already invited to use um, the app of this session and put forward a few questions. And you can also um, vote uh, for the questions of the other um, audience members. Otherwise, towards the end, you can also then uh, put your questions forward. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker here to give his speech slash presentation. And that is Andrew Collins, who is an assistant director for the Greater London Authority. Andrew, thank you. Matthias, uh, thank you. And, um Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk from a city perspective. I work, as Matthias has just said, for the Greater London Authority. I'm going to try and keep my thoughts coherent, but uh, I've been up since half past three in the morning, so uh, do excuse me if uh, I wonder uh, a little bit aimlessly at times. Um, I'm just going to try to explain to you how we're dealing with this thorny issue of uh, city data governance in a city like London. And I'm going to start off by saying that I think we're trying to deal with this on two levels. 
First, we want to keep it startlingly simple and related to outcomes. And the reason that I say this is because I've got political masters who I think it's really actually important to bring on board at this stage to make sure that they understand and value this uh, important city asset called data. So therefore, whatever we do with city data and city data governance over the top of that, over the top of that, it has to be linked to the challenges and opportunities in a city like London, and ultimately the things that will help improve lives and win votes for politicians. And then I think, even simpler than that, we just need to get really down to the basics and start to ask how data can help to answer the questions around how we run things better in the city. But critically, there are barriers, very obvious barriers that um, stand in the way, and we need to understand absolutely how we overcome that. We need to be really clear about that in governance. And this is part of trying to achieve the correct sort of balance that we need to strike between technology-led discussions, industry-led discussions, and discussions that actually relate to government and the things that we're trying to do. Too often, we don't strike the right balance there. But for all that simplicity, then we absolutely have to deal with the complexity and scale of the issues in hand. And complexity and scale runs right the way across social, economical, economic and technology um, issues. Matthias, in his introduction, just mentioned Uber and Airbnb. We are at the moment in a situation where we're almost reverse engineering regulation around disruptive business models like Airbnb and, uh, and, and Uber and plenty more besides. So we have a whole series of sort of societal trends around participatory models of, um, of, of, of government and city services, and, uh, we need, and, and we need to overcome those. The volume of data in our cities, if not overwhelming today, whether it's London or a much smaller environment, is already overwhelming or will be overwhelming. And we really need to understand how we extract the value from an asset of that particular scale. And of course, personal data, um, is the thing that powers the internet at the moment. It's not always the things that, power, that powers public services in our city. So again, with regards to, per, with, with, with regards to um, uh, privacy and uh, data security, these are the things that we need to get on top of um, um, as the internet becomes more pervasive in the city economy and in city services. And above all else, we have this vision in London of establishing a city data market. And to make this city data market function properly, in which we've got participants from the private sector, from the public sector, individual citizens themselves and households, then we need to make sure that whether, a utility, whether you're a utility company and we want you to share energy data, um, then we allow you the means by which to do so. We also need to deal with issues like monetization and data security. All of these things are vital in, in ensuring supply in a, in a properly functioning city data market. The things that will help ensure quality, frequency, regularity and veracity of data. And I think Matthias also referred to this in his introduction as well. One of the things that we're absolutely clear about in a city like London is that we simply cannot do this alone. The capacity that I have at my disposal in City Hall, whether it's legal advice or data science capabilities, are not um, of, 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 of sufficient scale to make sure that the, envi that the city data environment operates, on, operates effectively. So we need to ensure, I think, through governance that we do things that relate to quick wins, to keep the politicians happy, but that also sets out an effective framework that helps us deal with the things that I've already mentioned over the longer term. Because we have this desire for a city data market as well, one of the things that I'm acutely aware of is that um, sort of building out that point that City Hall cannot do this on its own, then we need to ensure that governance is cross-sectoral and covers both data and the supporting technology. Matthias again was mentioning urban platforms. Um, we, we, we need to make sure that uh, we're considering those and not just the raw material as well. But what's the London experience? I want to touch on that for a few minutes. Mine is a city where I think, you know, for all of the technology that surrounds us, and you can see plenty of it over my shoulder out there in the exhibition area, there are some hugely practical considerations that we now need to get to grips with. We need to consider what form city data infrastructure will have in a city like London. We've got 32 municipal authorities that sit beneath my own organisation. They will all want, to some extent or another, data warehouses or data stores, open data stores, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what we do need 
need to ensure is that in that convening role that an organisation like the Greater London Authority could have, operating at that strategic level of government, then we are dealing with data operability and harmonisation where there is point in sharing that data. And that's really where we need governance to kick in to establish the framework to make that happen. We also need to consider in what form data can be shared as well. Traditionally, London has been an open data city, but is that always feasible? We have to ask ourselves that question now, and we have to move to a position, I think, where if we're talking about other forms of data rather than just government data or institutional data, then we absolutely have to be deadly serious about, um, about presenting secure data sharing environments where sensitive forms of service data can be, can, can, be, can be brought out, not necessarily into the open, but at least into a position where that data can be exploited and we can glean value from it. How's London doing, though, really, when I sort of look at our bill of health? Um, Eddie from uh, Nesta will talk in a few minutes about some of the work that we're doing around establishing a London office of data analytics, which is based on data sharing and using data to answer, um, and answer pressing problems in the city. We're arriving slowly but surely at data sharing agreements there. Again, some of this stuff is really not that interesting in some respects. It's what I call dull but worthy, but we absolutely have to get there if we're to do smart things with the data over the longer term. Um, with citizens, we're establishing a London data exchange where actually we have private and public sector use cases that um, individuals can get to play with um, and decide how they think their data should be treated. So again, they get to be exposed to data security and data privacy issues and see how it relates to their own personal circumstances. But I think one of the things that we really need to do is to facilitate more data sharing and more um, data exploitation. Um, we have IoT test beds springing up in London, established by the likes of the Digital Catapult and the, and, and the Future Cities Catapult. It's essential that we try and build public trust around these IoT networks and implementations. And what is the governance model that we might have in the future for an IoT instrumented city? We're not there yet. Real ethical issues as well raised by the use of algorithms, statistical stereotyping and bias in data sets, um, use, and the obvious case there is predictive analytics and how it's sometimes used to I identify neighbourhoods which can be considered criminal hotspots, issues that I think it's important for city government to get to grips with. Um, just to conclude, governance can often be seen as a really quite dull thing, but I would emphasise, and it's typical that the man from the government stands in front of you and talks about these things, I think we need more of it. I think we need really positive front foot governance. We have a smart London board, which again deals with all that technology that I was talking about. What I'd like to see in the future is a London data board that is clearly tasked with some of those issues that I've been talking about. How do we tackle data ethics, privacy, security, monetization? We do that and then proper smart things can start to happen in a city like London. And key to this is technology preparedness in the public services as well, which, uh, as I said, around sort of new disruptive business models is something that we don't always get right. But above all else, this is an opportunity to take advantage of the city data opportunity, to talk to industry effectively, to communicate what data can do to policy experts and city leadership in the form of chief executives and politicians. But just as importantly as well, it's about bringing communities and customers along for the ride as well. Cheers. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <coughs> so, among all the things you've said, I picked up two, um, two important messages already. <laughs> Just two. <laughs> To keep it short and simple, so you, you mentioned that you know when it comes to governance, you should early on and uh, concentrate on outcomes, and think about monetization as well, and keep in mind that the, the city government can't do it alone. It's a corporation across the different departments with the different service providers, but also with citizens. So thanks a lot, and now please welcome our next speaker who's um, Ruth B. Yesner-Clark, who's a research director at IDC. Thank you. I'm hoping that this works. Do I have to use this? Yes. OK. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm Ruth B. Yesner-Clark. And I'm coming at this from a researcher and consultant side that works with cities and the vendors that serve them around smart cities. So what I'm going to talk about today in my brief eight minutes, and we did get two minutes shaved off of our time, so I'm going to probably start talking really fast at the end. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. One, 
why really this topic is very important. And I don't think it's that dull, but um, it, you know, it does get into the weeds a little bit. So why we're talking about proactive uh, data governance and how can cities get started? And I'm going to talk about some work that we've done with New York City as a case example. So I think we all know this, but the promise of smart cities and the outcomes that we have been talking about around financial, social, environmental impact really does rest on the data, right? So, you know, just looking at the type of connected society that we have, we're looking at a lot of faster, newer types of data that can help with this improved decision making. And I think that's really the core value. You can do things cheaper in an automated way and actually get new types of data that you may have never had before, right? You may never have understood where an exact gunshot was pinpointed or how many people were using your parks. And so I think when we start to think about smart cities and the value they offer, we're talking about it resting on this idea of um, using data. And I think we're also talking about a context of immense change. We've mentioned Airbnb and Uber, and I think, um, I love this quote, which is really, this could really be chaos. We're talking about a lot of data from a lot of devices with a lot of vendors offering services, and how do we start to think of data governance all the way from the device, through the infrastructure, through the software, to the worker on the street? And oftentimes we focus a lot on the hardware side, but there's a lot of implications for the actual city worker and actual visitor, or tourist, or resident that's happening in cities. And so I think there's some risk, right? There's a risk of cities standing still and letting these things happen to them. There's the risk of moving forward without structure. You've got to really think about your data architecture and your data strategy um, and what happens with data, you know, data, I have here, um, data correlations that maybe take anonymous data and make them not anonymous anymore? Or what happens to unionized environments when you're trying to change processes because you've you know, got some new data streams and you can change the way they're doing their job? So I think we really need to put that in context as well of, of some risk here around the chaos that's happening with all this connected information and data growth. And so here's the example of all the data, uh, the devices we have. Uh, IDC projects that we have 4,800 devices connecting to the internet right now per minute in the world. We're talking about um, 152,000 connecting per minute to the, uh, to the internet in um, 2025 with 80 um, zettabytes of data. And um, actually very, very low percentage of that data being used effectively. So we have done a lot of studies on the growth of data in the world, and about 10% right now is being used effectively. So how can we add in governance and analytics that help that data be used so that we can make those improved decisions and, and have the outcomes that we want? Um, so what does this mean for a city looking at, you know, okay, so we're going to have billions, 80 billion devices. Obviously, what does that mean for an actual city at the city level? So I just put this up there to use New York as an example to talk about um, the fact that they're potentially right now managing two to three million devices in different departments, in different agency and departmental silos, and with, with the beginnings of a governance strategy. But when you think of that, that could translate even for smaller cities into 25,000 um, devices for a population only of 100K, right? So you're really looking at a tremendous amount of device and data management that's coming even for smaller size cities. So the other reason that I mentioned why this is important is I think we see a lot happening around innovation hubs and co-development and experimentation with vendors around smart cities. We did a survey that asked, you know, how's your typical way of funding some of these new initiatives? And the first one was, well, we, we put a new budget line item in. And the second way was, is we offer our city up as a test case to co-innovate with a vendor. And oftentimes that means the city gives up their data to the vendor and the vendor monetizes the data themselves. to make They have to make money too, right? That's fine. You have to think about that in your longer term strategy. What are you giving up if you are releasing your data and not collecting it yourself? And um, what does that mean for your future implications? So I think that's just a caution I noticed in looking at how these things are funded is um, thinking about how you're co-innovating, what that means for your data strategy. So in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to touch on some really interesting work that's happening with New York City that we worked on with them. 
And the reason why I use them as example is because I think it's a first of its kind example of a city that put forth a proactive data governance policy and guidelines um, citywide. And I also think um, that they did it in a really interesting way because they involved a really broad ecosystem of partners. So they had international cities, Paris, Dubai, they had the private sector, 15 different private vendors, they had international standards bodies, we had the ACLU, which is a nonprofit in the US that focuses on um, privacy and civil rights, we had academics, and they had all the city departments working on this. So they were able to really put forth a draft set of guidelines and get a lot of buy-in through this process. I think the other thing that's interesting about New York is they were able to frame data governance in five key areas, which I'll show later. Each one has a vision statement. Each one has eight to 10 guidelines. And they were able to put these forward along these areas to really help their cities um, structure procurement and how they're working and managing their data. And I think the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that these guidelines are open, they're online, and they have already had 21 cities in the US sign on to use them. So they're really interested in developing an ecosystem of other cities that could help them build upon these guidelines and use them and make them better. And I think that's really interesting as well. So um, as I mentioned, these are a culmination of a, a long intensive process that I think other people could leverage. Um, they've taken five governance areas privacy, transparency, data management, operations and sustainability, infrastructure and security, and created a vision around each one. So for example, what is New York's vision around sustainability and operations from putting devices on infrastructure and collecting that data? What is their vision and their statement that they can make publicly about how they use and sell and share data for citizens that are concerned about privacy and transparency? And finally, um, I think what's also interesting about these guidelines as a first step for cities is to think you don't always have to go policy regulation route if you want to do something sort of quickly. If you can get principles and guidelines out there and enable a broad group of stakeholders to buy into this process of developing them, you can start to make some changes pretty quickly without necessarily thinking about a regulation or policy change as a first step. Um, and so these are just some of the ways that these guidelines are supporting the whole of the city around supporting new policies and protocols, um, tools and checklists to help with procurement. Um, we have a great example of a park, Parks and Rec wanted to buy a park bench. They wanted to buy a connected park bench. Their procurement was to procure it as a traditional park bench, which totally doesn't work for a Wi-Fi data collecting park bench. And so they really needed some support with these guidelines to help them figure out how to work with this new type of vendor. And so finally, in my last 15 seconds, I'm, I'm proud of myself here, um, just some next steps and guidance. I think, you know, looking at writing some of your own guidelines, getting your center of expertise, um, really enlisting support citywide, and then of course testing your guidelines out is key. Um, and then some other points is I really would caution cities specifically on not giving your data away lightly um, and figuring out what your strategy is there. Um, thinking about the fact that you could do something informally that still could have a broad impact around proactive data governance. Um, thinking about developing that smart city expertise with a team in the city that can support the departments that may need some guidance but don't have it in the, their own departments. And finally, really looking at the specific set of skills we need for people that can blend the, the discussion around business outcomes and technology together and sort of has that team building set of skills, which I think we're seeing is really, really important as we start to talk about smart city initiatives. And so that's it for me. Thank you so much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ruth B. Um, so it resonated quite a lot what you said, I think, generally with cities that um, there's a lot of data that's, uh, that they're sitting on. And only, as you said, only 10% are used effectively. That's quite an interesting figure. And um, the, 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 this image of chaos that they have to rain upon. So um, our advice, I think, generally here as a panel is um, think of a strategic approach first. It doesn't have to be, go too deep in the beginning, but um, think about of, um, how you can monetize um, that data for, for your city and for the benefit of your citizens. I think that's, that's a strong message from, from the two speakers already. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to invite our next speaker, um, Yuki Masa Otani, um, who is um, Director General at Cope City Japan. Good 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming today. My name is Yukimasa Otani, and I'm direct, the Director General uh, of the Planning and Coordination Bureau of the Kobe City Government. Today, I would like to give you an overview of our ICT strategy. And I thank you in advance for your kind attention. <coughs> Uh, I'm uh, responsible for uh, creating and coordinating policies, uh, managing statistical data, and uh, uh, promoting city design Kobe, uh, stra strategies, the development of the information age economy. Uh, today, I would like to tell you about the, act uh, the actions our city is taking to find solutions to regional challenges concerning the application of ICT. Let's talk about the first project. The Kobe City government has formed a partnership with a leading mobile network provider, NTT Docomo, to carry out trial neighborhood watch program for small children. We set up receivers at fixed uh, checkpoints, uh, such as elementary schools, children's centers, libraries, and stations, along with a um, special receiver application. Uh, that, co uh, that cooperating uh, local, local businesses and local residents uh, have installed in their smart homes. Uh, these receivers uh, pick up uh, signals from passing children who are carrying Bluetooth low energy tires, and then uh, notify the uh, server uh, regarding the location data for each child. Uh, this trial project uh, co consists uh, not only fixed checkpoints uh, through detectors in public institution, institution, institutions or public transportation systems, uh, but thanks to the uh, uh, co cooperation of businesses with, uh, within Kobe, detectors are also located in private shops and offices. This project is concludes mobile, mobile checkpoints by using an application uh, installed in staff and employee homes. Thanks to the cooperation of local residents, we were able to in increase the number of mobile checkpoints, allowing us to establish this uh, detect de uh, detection network over with the area and uh, create a highly uh, precise uh, uh, neighborhood watch uh, service. Uh, the, uh, the second project is a data academy training program oriented to the Kobe City government employees. Uh, the aim of the Data Academy is to encourage uh, data-driven policy planning, uh, beginning with open data, and uh, more efficient city operations. Uh, operations. Uh, government beginning with open data and uh, more efficient city operations, uh, operations. Government employees gain insights about the importance of data-driven approaches uh, through practi practical case studies. In this photo, you can get an impression uh, of this workshop involving the uh, operation and use, use GIS. Thanks to this program, we can see the beginnings of this kind of technology being used even within our city officials, offices. Uh, the third project I want to touch on is an, an open data visualization workshop called World Data Biz Challenge 2016, which we are holding in partnership with the city of Barcelona. Our goal is to pave the way uh, toward a new era of open government by creating open data case studies and bringing uh, an innovative kind of work, workhorse. You can see the banner for this uh, workshop on this slide. Uh, participants uh, are mainly university students and young IT business engineers from Kobe. During the first stage in June, 
we conducted a workshop in Barcelona in which visualization works from both Kobe and Barcelona were presented and discussed. Uh, furthermore, uh, we conducted uh, tours of the Barcelona Municipal Institute for Information, the Urban Ecology Agency of Barcelona and other institutes. The participants prepared for the second presentation here in Kobe this past October by polishing up their original presentations and learning from Barcelona's reading each age experience. As a result, students from a local university in Kobe received the prize for best presentation. This project is called PRISM. Uh, and it has the following unique features. It visualizes crime information based on severity and uh, creates a heat map. Uh, it then uh, calculates the risk for each citizen depending on time and distance to all crime scenes. Finally, uh, it can analyze trends and uh, correlations along such lines as this crime often occurs on trains or that crime has no connection to the uh, surrounding facilities. Uh, this illustrated why PRISM is a system uh, that can give accurate information to directly uh, assist the prevention of crime against our citizens and the government. We are now working hard to ensure that uh, this uh, project, project and other uh, promising ones uh, it, uh, implemented into society. Now, I'd like to tell you about the final measure we are taking. Uh, the Kobe City government is uh, officially partnering with the Barcelona based Sentiro Sensor Platform to bring uh, even more support to this sensor project. We are currently examining uh, how the sensors can be used for policy planning or business solutions. I hope that through this brief overview, you have been able to gain some sense of the measures and the policies Kobe is currently taking. However, I assure you uh, that there is still much more for you to experience in Kobe. Uh, in Kobe. Kobe is a city between the mountain and the sea. It's famous for its diverse culture, breathtaking night view, exciting crews, and Arima Onsen, traditional hot springs. Additionally, it offers, offers gourmet food and drinks like Kobe beef, sweet, and nada sake. I truly, hope, I truly hope that you uh, come to uh, visit us in Kobe. I sincerely look forward to, to uh, talking with you and exchange ideas. Uh, thank you for kind attention during my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Otani. So um, again, uh, a few messages that, that, I've, that I've just picked up. So um, you mentioned this, this data ac academy, which of course is, is a, a very interesting tool, very innovative for um, building capacity, which is hugely needed and doing that within a city government. And at the same time, you mentioned cooperation. Like uh, we have here in Europe, the European Innovation Partnership, where Andrew is hugely involved in, in, in um, joining forces with other cities and exploring ideas and you said that that you do this between Cope City and Barcelona which is which is always very important to to step out of of, uh, of your own uh, thought uh, boundaries so thanks a lot for uh, for your presentation and now um, our next speaker is um, Eddie Copeland who is um, direct now I have to look up the director at Nesta Eddie Well, we're here today thinking about the questions that uh, City Hall needs to ask when it comes to using data at a city scale. And I think if we're to make sense of that, we need to put it into some political context. Uh, what are the big challenges that keep city leaders, public service managers awake 
at night? Well, I'd suggest there are two big ones. Uh, the first is the, the funding crisis affecting many public service organizations, uh, certainly in European cities. Um, coming from England, our local authorities in England alone face a 12.4 billion pound funding shortfall by 2020. Uh, similar figures can be given for many other countries, I know. And when we get a funding shortfall like that, that tells us three things. Number one, uh, business as usual is not an option. Uh, number two, merely incrementally cutting back on public services is not sufficient. And so three, either we have to switch some services off, which is not good news, or we fundamentally reinvent the way that they work. And I, I opt for that version. Uh, the second big challenge, I think, is this profound level of public disengagement with traditional political parties, political institutions, political elites. Uh, whatever you may think of Brexit, whatever you may think of the recent US election or the rise of Marine Le Pen, I think there's a compelling narrative that they are at least in some part symptomatic of this problem of public dissatisfaction with traditional political systems. So I'd politely suggest that if our city data strategy is not somehow addressing those big challenges, we are utterly missing the point. And as city leaders are thinking about, well, what do I need to think about when it comes to data? My concern is that they are often being misled by part of the smart city narrative that actually places uh, perhaps the order of the problem in the wrong order. And I'll explain it like this. Much of the smart city narrative um, goes like this. It says, we live at a time when there are a game, when a number of game-changing technologies have reached a state of maturity. We've got the internet of things, we've got the power of the cloud, we've got mobile, we've got all these smartphones all our citizens are walking around with. And if we can just get the right technology into our cities, it will unleash all these amazing new data insights. And with those data insights, we're quietly confident that we can develop these smarter ways of working. And it's a wonderful narrative. It's a very compelling narrative. It's also completely wrong, in my view. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because it causes three major problems. If we think this is about technology, first and foremost, that is the most disempowering message you could present to City Hall. It says to public service managers, to frontline workers, to uh, political leaders and to citizens, all your experience, all your knowledge, everything you've developed, all your opinions, that, that's not what matters. You need to defer this to the IT experts. They're the ones who have the solution here. Uh, technology is a tool, it's not the end, and we need to make sure we get that the right way around. The second problem, if we think this is technology first, is that we end up taking new technology and bolting it onto the same old processes, the same old ways of working, and it's those ways of working that need changing, not so much the technology. And then the final point is that we end up, if we're not careful, if we think this is about the technology first, that cities are encouraged to spend millions of pounds to give them even more technology, that gives them even more data that they have absolutely no idea how to use. Because the vast majority of cities out there, and some of them will be attending this conference looking for answers, the vast majority, I will bet you, have not even scratched the surface of what can be done with the vast quantity of data that they already sit on. So what's the solution? Well, I think we've got to reframe the order. Instead of going from technology to data to ways of working, start with the ways of working. How do you want to work? What are fundamentally better, more efficient, more sustainable, more citizen-centric, more engaging ways of working? Next question, what data do you need to be able to work in those ways? And then the final question, the last question is what technology do you need to give you that data so that you can work in those um, ways? The technology can do whatever we want it to do. And when we think of it in this order, two things become apparent. Number one, we actually already know a lot of those smarter ways of working. Citizens know them, public service managers know them, City Hall knows them. Uh, the second problem, or the second realization, is that what stops us from adopting them is not a lack of technology. It's the fragmentation of our existing data, what I call the jigsaw problem. Everyone's got their little piece of their data. Very rarely do we have the ability to bring it together. And if you're trying to reform public services, that's a really big headache. If you want to uh, scale the use of shared services, joining up assets, resources, teams, how can you do it if you can't see the scale of the demand, the problem, the data beyond your geographic boundaries? If you want to target your resources at areas of greatest need, you can do it, 
but not if you don't have the data that shows you where that need is. If you want to predict and prevent problems before they become serious, we can go out there, we can find data sets that correlate with high risk, but you need the data to do it. And if we want civic hackers, businesses, innovators to build cool apps and services with open data, they're not going to do it if we release open data separately on 101 different portals covering a tiny population that isn't a sufficient potential customer base to generate a viable business model. So it's that fragmentation that's the problem. So if City Hall is wondering what questions they should be asking with when it comes to data governance, starting with how they overcome that fragmentation. We know there are technical challenges with old IT systems that make it hard to get the data out. We know that there are data challenges where we've got different standards and we can sort those out. But the bigger questions I'd suggest are around the culture of our organizations, the organizational structure of our organizations. Are they set up to be able to collaborate and work together? Uh, do we have the skills in place in our public sector body so that not just a team of data geeks, but frontline workers know how to use data in a meaningful way in their roles? Um, the second barrier, well, so in addition to that culture and organizational barriers, are the legal barriers and making sure that public service managers, City Hall, have the understanding of what the law does and, do not, and does not allow when it comes to the use of data. Many people very scared to touch it at all because it seems so intimidating. So step one, I'd suggest for cities, figure out how you can bring together, analyze and act upon the vast quantity of data that already sits in the public sector. Step two, why don't we flip uh, in reverse the idea of an open data portal and do what Andrew suggested and say, why don't we, instead of just publishing government data, why doesn't government publish its problems instead and say, hello world, what data have you got that can help us solve these issues? Because you can bet your life that businesses will have useful data, universities will have useful data, charities will have uh, useful data, citizens have data. Let's enable a data exchange, a data marketplace that unleashes data from wherever it may sit. And finally, once we've done all of that, it will become very obvious where we need new technology to fill in the data gaps to do whatever else uh, we need and to ensure that electricity services to conference centers can continue unaffected. Uh, so in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I think if we're talking about city data governance, let us start by, as a community, helping City Hall ask the right questions, uh, get their questions in the right order, Acknowledge that new technology has a huge amount of potential, but let's walk before we run and start by nailing the use of our existing data. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. So um, a, a similar message than before, so we, we are, you can see us again. Um, so, you know, when, when, you, when you think about data governance, don't start from the standpoint of, you know, buying in whatever uh, technology vendors want to sell you, but rather uh, approach it strategically. Think how you have to change to work in your government and how you can uh, deal with this fragmentation of data that the different departments sit on. Thanks a lot, Eddie. And now um, I invite our last speaker um, to give us a speech. It's Mr. Chen Yu Li, a director at the city of Taipei, Taiwan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chen Li from Taipei, Taiwan. I'm the director of Taipei Smart City PMO. <coughs> Uh, that's a, a special uh, project management office in Taiwan, and, and actually my things come from uh, association and uh, industry when I come from the government. And that's very important. I, I will show you why in the end of my presentation. So uh, actually, uh, when we're talking about smart city, I, I very agree with the Eddie. Uh, the, the real thing is what problem we need to solve and what uh, what the city, citizens need. So in Taipei, we got uh, uh, several aspects to, uh, you know, to make, making the uh, smart city going on. So actually, we were using the two different mechanisms in Taipei. When people are talking about their uh, bottom-up mechanism uh, and maybe the open, phone, op open platform mechanism, I, I'm not sure if, if you really understand what they are talking about. 
And actually, in uh, we uh, our office started uh, uh, in March. That that means we run uh, uh, about eight months. And currently, we uh, we uh, use the both way to promote the, the smart city in Taipei. That means when you're talking about the uh, white paper, we're doing white paper also. We we try to make some smart solutions from the department of the uh, city governments, but that's a top-down way. So, uh, and, and then in other size, we actually collect uh, 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 you know, uh, requests and uh, any uh, question from the people, and also we do lots of uh, experiments and interviews, and we have contact with lots of communities, and we add as an uh, open platform. That means uh, everyone can contact to us, uh, and then they can propose anything to us, and we will do what we can do. But actually, we cannot do er uh, everything, but we can do uh, probably how more than the old government can do. So that's the uh, way we are going now. And uh, uh, this slide show how it works. It's a very, it's just very simple flow. Uh, the people can uh, contact with us. Uh, could be the uh, industry or, or personal, what, whatever, and <clears throat> we will find some uh, field that, that, that they can use. For example, if you've got a very uh, good idea to, uh, you know, to, to solve the problem of the citizens, and you can come to us and we'll make it happen. And currently, we, we have uh, counted over uh, 150 cases, and uh, at least uh, 50 cases are going right now. Okay, so that, that's the some of the uh, example about the uh, Taipei Smart City Living Lab. Uh, actually, in Taipei, we, we established a lower lower network in Taipei. That and the uh, company called Jim Check they donate about thirteen uh, uh, roll up uh, roll APs in, in Taiwan. So uh, we provide it to to the, uh, everyone. They can use it as a, a, a POC. So. <coughs> Currently, we have uh, about 80 teams uh, to join this program. And also, we have lots of different uh, experiments in, in Taipei. Uh, for example, the UAV solution for the uh, 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 water quality mon uh, monitoring, and also the ARVR, and also the gym solution. <coughs> and also, uh, we try to use the different strategy for the uh, a public uh, smart infrastructure, for example, the, the smart traffic in Taipei. Uh, some, of, some of you may know the, the U-Bike system that's a very uh, successful story in Taiwan. Uh, and, uh, lots of people can rent a, a bicycle in, Ta in Taipei. Now they can ride, uh, rent a bicycle in all over the Taiwan. And we find out that it's uh, not a very good model to innovate things that the, the U-bike model, they, they could come check with the government. So it's very difficult for them to, to make some innovations. So we, for the next uh, U-model system, we uh, use a different strategies. That's what we call the bottom-up strategies. We just encourage, uh, encourage the, the company to cooperate with the Taipei city government so they can do anything they want. And we will try uh, to help them to promote them to find find them some uh, company they can cooperate with. And, that's, and I will show you a very uh, good example, which is uh, related to the data. I'm not talking about data yet. Yes. So so here comes the data. So in the first the first project in Taipei, I think is a very important. That's a very important case in Taipei. Uh, the, uh, there's a company that uh, they come to us and talking about the uh, air air box. That's a, a air quality monitoring devices, and then uh, it's not it's not a very uh, expensive uh, device. It costs about uh, 50 US dollars. So uh, the uh, the data is not very correct. But actually, they they they're willing to donate about 20, uh, 20 devices in. Uh, to the uh, Taipei city government, so we just deployment to the uh, to the school and uh, and uh, some some organizations. <coughs> so so the so the next 
those uh, those uh, devices they will produce lots of uh, data, uh, the, the data of the air qualities uh, every minute. But <coughs> actually, we, we have a, a problem with that. So who who can who who will monitor this uh, data? It's very uh, it's, it's it's impossible for the government to you know to monitor every data. So we have collaborated with an association called LAS in Taipei. Uh, they are very uh, care about the uh, uh, you know environment in Taipei, so so they will, uh, watch the uh, data uh, every minute. So they were making the announcement if the air, air quality is not very well. So that means you can get the information, the air in information that's close to you, make, maybe the the, uh, the the school next to you. And also, there are lots of companies that come to us and, and uh, talking about uh, different possibilities to co cooperate with the city hall. Uh, some propose about uh, uh, di disease evaluations. Yes, you got uh, air pollution data, then what? Here comes the disease evolutions. And also, propose for the uh, greening solution. We are thinking about not to use uh, uh, air, air, clean, air cleaner to clean the air. We, we uh, uh, wish to have a more, you know, sustainable solutions for the, for air yeah, air quality. So that's a green solutions. And also, uh, uh, some company will come to us and talking about a, a portable person, personal air air box, uh, air monitoring system that make you um, uh, know your uh, air quality around you. And the last one is uh, most important one is. Uh, one of the com company called Zero Air, they come to us and they told, they told me they, they want to uh, uh, establish your uh, air maps in Taipei. They only need very few uh, more uh, sensors to do that. The, uh, the way to do is to put a sensor in, uh, on the uh, vehicle, on the moving vehicles. So they come to, come to me and ask me if I can put their sensor in, in top of the bus. It's very difficult, actually. Since if I put that, put their sensor in the in the bus, that means there's lots of sensor will in the top of the bus in Taipei. So, so uh, what we going to do? We just uh, match them to the to the Wemo I just mentioned. So they can put put their sensor in, inside the the uh, the the U motor, the Wemo systems, and that means. <coughs> Uh, for a for a startup company, uh, okay, I guess thirty seconds. For the startup company, it's very difficult to get money uh, uh, from the, you know rent, uh, car sharing or car pooling system at very early uh, stage. But actually, they can, uh, they can maybe they can get uh, benefit or, or uh, money from the data data selling. So 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 we just match them to cooperate with each others. So that's why what we are doing in Taipei right now. Okay. I think, um, I think the, the, that's my last. We, we just want to deal with the uh, real problem. The, I just mentioned we come f uh, not from the government, from the association, association and industry because we think the problem is not the government thinks, but what people care. So. Uh, we also try to uh, establish a global smart city club. It's not an official uh, LEO or, or organization. We just uh, try to meet someone. They, they can do, uh, they do the same thing with us and they can share the experience with us. So uh, please welcome to contact me if you're interested. And also we have a whole uh, uh, a smart city expo that we next year. Yes. And then. Welcome to Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Li. So um, just, uh, just a quick one this time. So um, Chen Yu Li um, also stressed uh, the point that when you, when you look into a, a developing a strategic approach, do it bottom up and top down, which um, would lead me to my first question. Um, just to get this Q&A going and then afterwards I hope you have already submitted some questions through the 
to the app or um, you will do so in the next minute. Otherwise, there, there are microphones here and there. So please raise your hand then. But my, my first question is, um, especially to the cities, I suppose. So how do you get the attention of the, the top leaders in the city and how do you keep it? after elections, which is obviously a common, a common problem to cities, that the priorities change once elections have taken place. This. So oh. then, <laughs> Andrew, please. Is this? There we go. Ah, it's working. Yeah. Um, how do we get the attention of city leaders? Um, well, get absolutely involved in some of their new policy priorities. So um, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I'll try desperately not to repeat what uh, a couple of others already have picked up upon, but uh, things like air quality in a city like London, for example, is an obvious area where actually a discipline like data science based on data that is brought together from a wider variety of sources, not just what I call our expensively parked Rolls Royces, which are, are really high quality monitoring stations, but which are spaced really widely apart. Um, so that would be one example. Another example is Energy for London, where uh, we are trying to look at new forms of large-scale decentralized energy and how we bring them into the marketplace in a way that the market hasn't currently managed so far. Again, there are huge data issues that sit behind that. So it's just really a matter of utterly understanding the policy, trying to stop people policy customers, politicians saying to you, yes, Andrew, data's just a bit niche, and uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's relevant to them. And a lot, unfortunately, about making data um, broader is, and I know you said it's, it's not dull, we here don't think it's dull, but getting people to understand data interoperability and standards and issues like that is probably not high on my list of priorities, but um, I do recognize its importance. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, we, we, we take the next question. So we have, we have received a few questions here. Are there any more uh, that want to raise their hands and speak up? Otherwise, oh, now it's off. Um. Thank you, well, the panelists. So my question is right. regarding healthcare Good. data. So we're talking about healthcare use cases that should be addressed by smart city. We come into the issues of the privacy and uh, confidentiality. So how can we go about these issues within the data governance framework? There's a mic there. We, uh, we have one here. Okay. Um, would just a, an early reaction. It is possible to use uh, personal data, obviously, but uh, most of the time you can do it if you have a very, very specific reason. You've got a compelling uh, benefit case that says, look, if we can do this, this will be of direct benefit, uh, particularly for users, not just for the organizations, but if you want citizens to accept it, making sure they can see the advantage as well. I think our general experience, where Andrew and I have been looking at trying to set up an office of data analytics for London, um, it's so, so much easier if you can address an issue with non-personal data. It's faster, it's less controversial, you don't have to go through the data sharing arrangements uh, to the same extent. There are some issues, some complex issues, healthcare being a classic example where that's simply not possible. And I think what we need to do is start simple. Let's try some basic initiatives that are not very controversial. Let's build confidence that we can do it well. If we can succeed on those, I think more leaders, more citizens, uh, more public service managers will appreciate what can be done. And I think that will build the confidence we can do more complex stuff. Um, so the question was, should there be some examples where in an emergency you should be able to use the personal data no matter what? I suspect it will depend on laws country uh, by country. Um, cultural attitudes to this change very much. Um, but in most cases, for most public services, certainly in the UK, if there is an urgent life or death situation, you'll find that most things 
actually can be done. And there's a misconception that data protection laws stop you from doing uh, things where there's a very, very clear benefit, and that would be one. Uh, actually, I think that's uh, depend on the law of the countries, and then Taiwan, it, it, actually, it's very easy. You just need them to sign the agreement of the data, yes. That, that would uh, uh, answer the problem. I was just going to add that I also think there are some examples where you can go to what Eddie was saying and, and have a specific problem that you're trying to solve. And there are problems you can solve in healthcare that don't always rely on personal uh, data. So um, if you want to reduce, we were talking about this yesterday, the example of hospital readmission. There are some ways you can correlate to see what's causing readmissions that is not actually personally specific, but then you can apply it to a specific patient once you have the correlations. So I think that that's another way of problem first and then seeing what the data can do for you to reach that problem. And it could be just on generalized anonymous data as well. Okay, thank you. So, no, I'm, I'm equipped. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm taking then one question here through the app. Um, it's from Ingrid. I don't know if uh, she can raise her hand. So we see, who, oh, there. Um, so she has a question that is personalized post to Ruth B, which, I, um, which is on the, on, URL, on the URL for the NYC guidelines, but yeah. that you can also deal with later. All the speakers will remain here for a few minutes, so if you have questions, they're happy to answer them individually afterwards as well. But I'm going to pick up your other question, which is, since data are not confined to city boundaries and knowledge is scarce, should we not collect data on a national level? So how do you deal with, um, you know, with, um, with the different data levels? Who wants to go first? Who dares? <laughs> I can say something quickly for the U.S. and the U.S. because the U.S. has about 10,000 different levels of government and it's, in terms of the fragmentation issue, a huge problem. And I doubt that we'll ever be able to, for that specific country, um, manage things on a national level to some degree. So I also think the answer is probably state level maybe, yeah, is that... Um, specifically in that area that it's, it's probably, I think it's very country specific and how the country itself is set up. And we do see lots of things being conducted on a national level in India and, and citizen cards and things like that. So it's, I think it depends on the country to, to a large degree. I mean, just one general principle I'd add is, um, uh, Certainly in the context of European politics, we talk about the principle of subsidiarity, do things at the lowest level where it makes sense to do so. That's often misinterpreted at just do everything really, really locally. But I think on an issue by issue basis, we should say pragmatically, is there value in trying to do this at a city scale or at a regional scale or at a state scale? Because um, by and large, we know data delivers value through being shared and joined up. And the problem is the silos. But if you're trying to get a public service which is done at a city scale, you probably need the data at a city scale. If you're trying to sort out uh, pollution at a regional scale, you need it at that scale. And then, of course, there's another subset of issues that only can be done sensibly nationally or even internationally. Uh, and I think you just have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'll pick one here from the app. Sorry. Well, there, there is a similar one. What are the edges of a city data environment, which, uh, which I, I suppose um, touches on that as well, or do you see another angle on how to answer that question? Andrew, please. Um, I try, try and pick up on the answer to the last question as well, because, I, and this is where I go back to some of the disciplines and the technology and don't actually come at it from the problem perspective, which I think is hugely valuable in some respect. So 
as we um, at the GLA have started to work through some of our modeling, uh, our scenario modeling, we just sort of spilled out over the borders because we have to. And we can do that now using programming language like R in a way that we couldn't do with Excel that just allows us to export what we do simpler uh, in a more simple fashion to other authorities, whether they are ones that border with London whether and, and with which we have an economic um, relationship, um, or indeed whether they are elsewhere. So we have created something called the London Schools app, um, sorry, London Schools Atlas, which is just about understanding how population and other pressures um, um, turn into schools places, uh, which is helpful in, uh, in planning a very under pressure service. And that is something for which we just share the code and it can be used elsewhere. And I, and I think that's where cities are valuable because they are by and large magnets for talent, but there's no reason why we should keep that talent to ourselves we should, you know, where we can, just share this stuff and do so with pride. Um, and I had another point on the um, that picked up on city collaboration, which is what Matthias was referring to earlier. And in the European Innovation Partnership and our work on urban platforms there, I think it's slightly misnamed because it's all about how actually we exploit data to its maximum possible advantage using, by and large, urban platforms. But that's an example of where cities are coming together just to face the market, I think, in a much more sort of mature and straightforward way and will allow for a stronger relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You have, you have the chance to ask one more question, and then I'll pick another one here from the app, or two. Maybe here from this side? Oh, can, where's the microphone now? No, do you have it here? This, this one's specifically for, for Eddie. You talked about um, the, having technology as the focus is quite disempowering. Um, what are some of the ways that you, that you think would help that? In that we are still talking about technology, but how can you frame it in a way that, that would make it more empowering? Um, so, good question. I think the challenge for a community, like I'm guessing most of the people who come to a conference like this one, is that we feel quite able to talk about technology. We do go to conferences where we talk about open standards, open architecture, and the rest. Um, and I think often that language can be very impenetrable to political leaders. As Andrew said, if you've got a newly elected mayor, they care about energy, the environment, education, schools. They do not, well, it's the rare exception if they care about the technology. So if we as a community cannot articulate to them how technology plays a role in serving their priorities, we shouldn't be surprised if we struggle to embed useful technologies into cities. And I think that's why I'm really keen that we say, okay, what do you want to do? And hopefully that's not just political leaders, that's a wider conversation with citizens, uh, other public service bodies, local government. What is it you're trying to solve? Let's see, have we already got the data that could do that? Because it may not be a technology barrier, it might just be we don't have the skills, it may be the data's over there and you never thought to join it up. And there are a subset of issues where absolutely we can't really solve them unless we've got real-time uh, data. Uh, and that's where maybe we do need to look and embed some new technology. Uh, but in many cases, just one example, something like congestion, before we start going out and thinking we need to procure a huge new IoT network that covers a city, you could just talk to some mobile phone companies and say, can you already give us you know, live traffic maps based on triangulating mobile phone signals? The answer may be no, or maybe they won't give you that data, or maybe it's too expensive, but I think we should at least have that conversation before jumping to a, an assumption that the solution is a procurement exercise rather than a much harder, more fundamental rethinking of how a service operates. I just wanted to add something uh, from the New York case example, which I thought was really interesting that we, we struggled with in writing these guidelines. So the guidelines were meant to be citizen facing as, a well, as well as internally used. And so one of the early things I said to the city was, well, then we have to have a plain text rule, meaning we have to be able to talk about technology in a way that anybody on the street can read the guideline and understand what they're saying. And um, we failed, I think, in this because it became incredibly hard to develop a guideline that a department could use that was written in 
language that didn't use technical terms that may be inexplicable to people. And so then we decided, they said, oh, maybe we could have a, a separate set of guidelines that were for the, the people. And I said, that is going to raise a lot of questions of suspicion to have two sets of guidelines, one for the city, one for the actual citizens, right? So I think it's a, a very big struggle also just around language and education because you have to be able to explain um, sometimes technological things in a very non-technical way. And so there has been a series of, sorry, infographics and pictures that they've put together to sort of supplement, to be able to say when we talk about this, this is a picture of what the sensor looks like, this is what it's doing, this is what it's for. And just by using very clear examples, I think it's empowering to the people to get a very clear picture of what they're talking about. So I think that's one just very simple example of, of really educating and being open in, in how to explain things to the general population. Thank you, Ruthie. I, I, I'm picking up by the lapel, by the, 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 the lapel badge you're wearing that um, you work for a rather large global payments company. Is that correct? That's correct. Good. Right. Um, and most of you in the audience will have um, a, a, a card in your wallet, no doubt, with, this, with, with the same logo on it. Um, it's really interesting because you're one of the examples where we look at new forms of data to open up new policy discussions which are of distinct interest to political leaders. And I've got a very real example. So um, we in London are obviously concerned about Brexit and the Article 50 negotiations and the impact on um, society and on the economy um, as we move through the next couple of years. So at the moment, we have all of those administrative and really quite traditional and slow moving um, government data sets. What I really want to be able to do is to go to my sort of information hungry and sometimes impatient mayor and say, hey, I've got this data that you know, sort of explains on a sort of almost daily basis, no doubt you can do it by the hour or by the minute, um, on how the tourism economy is responding to a change in exchange rate, the pound against the dollar or the pound against the yen, the pound against the euro. I feel a lot poorer coming here nowadays, I tell you. But you know, tourists feel a lot um, wealthier coming and spending their money in London. That's a good thing. On the flip side of that, we have companies, small businesses, who might be benefiting from better export opportunities as a result of a weaker pound again. Your, your sort of data can help us sort of understand those real-time challenges and sort of th that really seems to have been one of the big points here. It's that in terms of making things interesting and making our discipline sort of closer to the hearts of politicians and leaders, then uh, we have to work hard to get the governance right so that you feel confident bringing forward your forms of data, monetized or not. Okay, thank you. So we, uh, our, our time's been up since 10 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, we better close here. Um, if, if you want to find the presentations, they will be uploaded at some point on, on, on the website. So um, you, you can dive back into uh, the information that was given here. I suppose you'll also be able to find the contact details of the speakers. Otherwise, you know, stay put for a few minutes and interact with them directly. And I want to thank you, all the speakers, for the insights that they've shared um, so far. And um, just, to, just to summarize three main points here that, that, that have been said during this session. So um, there was one statement that said that you should move away from this technology push and rather look into what the city really needs and what the citizens' concerns are and what their wishes are. That in order to overcome this chaos in data, you need a strategic approach. And you should look at the problems that are to solve. And ideally, this approach should be both bottom up and top down at the same time. And the third point that was stressed over and over again during the, uh, during the presentations was that cooperation is key. You need cooperation within your city departments, across the city departments, and with other cities and other stakeholders to make this governance uh, of data a success. So thanks a lot for your attention, and see you around uh, at the Expo over the next days. Thanks a lot.